Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's virtual program, uh, where we will be hearing some true and unusual tales of Brooklyn animals in old Brooklyn. Uh, my name is Bo Mendez. I'm the manager of programs and communications here at Brooklyn Historical Society. Uh, and normally it would be my great honor and privilege to welcome you all to our historic space in uh, Brooklyn Heights. Uh, but of course, since things have been as they are, we are uh, Brooklyn Historical Society, as I like to say, uh, located in the hearts and minds of all of us who cherish it. Uh, a little bit about us. We are a 150 plus year old institution that's dedicated to sharing the unique history of Brooklyn uh, over 400 years. Um, and a lot of times we focus on the human history of Brooklyn. Uh, history is a lot of times shaped and of course written by people, but we kind of like to also highlight other elements of historical events that have happened in Brooklyn, whether that be things that have been caused by the geography or the geology of the, or the climate, the climate of uh, the Brooklyn area or things like tonight where we'll be focusing on the stories of our furry friends and animals uh, who have helped shape uh, Brooklyn's history as well. Um, we have been doing and uh, trying to offer multiple uh, virtual programs since the uh, institution of the shelter in place orders a few months ago, and we are continuing to do so. We uh, are actually um, excited to highlight an upcoming program, uh, upcoming set of programs rather that are gonna be coming up uh, this month in July, uh, where we'll be focusing on um, how institutions like BHS can help tell stories of historical events that are sometimes happening kind of in real time. Um, next week on July 9th, we'll be partnering up with Culture Pass um, and uh, we will be sharing an event that looks at collections during the era of COVID-19. Brooklyn Historical Society joins uh, some of our esteemed peers at the Brooklyn Public Library and Queens Public Library to talk about the collections, the, the, the objects and uh, files, digital media that we've been trying to collect to help document this particular moment in history. Uh, and we'll be sharing some of the stories that we've been able to put together based off of contributions by viewers like you. Um, additionally, in this program, we'll also share more about our upcoming plans. Uh, for us at BHS in particular, we've only been able to accept uh, digital materials, uh, photographs, videos, uh, writing files, uh, but we hope to, when we open uh, again to the public, be able to accept physical things, posters, artwork, signage uh, that document how the borough has responded and how it's impacted all of our lives, whether it be our work life, our home life, education, uh, religious observances, everything. Uh, so look forward to that on July 9th. And then later on July 20th, we will be partnering with Culture Pass again to highlight uh, our Muslims in Brooklyn project. Uh, we have been collecting uh, a, a number of uh, oral histories. We're up to about 50, I believe, um, as part of our Muslims in Brooklyn initiative that documents the stories of people who identify as Muslim or are connected to Muslim communities in the borough of Brooklyn and the numerous uh, ways that they experience that connection with Islam. Um, in that program, we'll be sharing some of our uh, forthcoming website and uh, online curriculum that looks at the Muslim Brooklyn, Muslims in Brooklyn um, project and uses those those oral histories to talk about uh, universal themes that connect to everyone in Brooklyn and beyond and look at the power of oral history to, uh, to, to make that connection. So that'll be on July 20th. Uh, but again, back to the meat of tonight, uh, I am excited to welcome uh, to our virtual stage uh, Peggy Gavin, uh, who will be uh, leading tonight's uh, program. She has prepared um, a very immersive and fascinating uh, presentation that she'll be sharing with you all. And then we'll also be taking some time at the end for questions. So if you have any questions, I'd like to direct you to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you have a question, please submit it there and we'll make sure that it makes its way into the queue. Uh, but without further ado, I'd just like to welcome uh, tonight's speaker, uh, Peggy Gavin, who is a journalist and senior editor uh, based in Warwick, New York. Uh, she's the author of The Catman of Gotham, several children's books, and she also is the creator of the blog The Hatching Cat, uh, True and Unusual Animal Tales of Old New York, which has been profiled in Newsweek and The New York Times. Uh, we'll have some information about both of those in the chat. Um, and without further ado, please welcome to the virtual stage, uh, Peggy Gavin. Peggy, are you here? Can you hear me? 
think we might still have you on mute. There I'm, we go. There I am. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here and you're going to hear me because right now I'm up in Orange County, New York, and we are getting some thunderstorms. So please, everyone, cross your fingers that my power doesn't go out because where I am, it's a little bit rural here. So, and you will be hearing some thunder and you may also hear a cat. I have a cat who likes to participate when I do these events. So I wanna thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, we've got a, a great turnout tonight and I hope you're gonna enjoy some of these animal stories that I'm gonna be sharing tonight. A lot of the stories I'm gonna be telling tonight are based on my blog, The Hatching Cat NYC. And The Hatching Cat NYC is a collection of true animal stories from the 1800s through World War I. And what I do is I take animal stories and I share the history of New York through stories about cats and dogs and other things. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you over now. I'm gonna go off the screen here and I'm gonna start my presentation. Okay. All right, there we go. Okay, so as I was saying, um, I started this blog, uh, Hatching Cat NYC, in about 2013. And as you can see, um, I write about not only cats, I write about horses and chickens and turtles and any kind of animal that had a part in history. And I find that it's really a fun way to learn about history. For example, how fun is it to know that right before the, his, the Brooklyn Bridge opened up, about a month before the bridge opened up, they had a ceremonial cat crossing. So this was in 1883, and it's a true story. It was in the New York Times, and there was a, a saloon keeper over in Manhattan, and he thought it would be a good idea to kind of christen the bridge before it opened to the public with a cat. So that's just kind of uh, some of the types of stories I would tell. I, I tell about Ned on my, my blog, but that's a fun way to, for children and adults to learn about history. Even more relevant today, did you know that cats and dogs were among the largest victims of the polio epidemic in 1916? The epidemic was actually first reported in Brooklyn. There were several children in the uh, Gowanus Canal area that were reported. And the epidemic caused a lot of uh, irrational behavior. A lot of people were wrongly convinced that cats and dogs were responsible for spreading the disease. Even some newspapers told people to put their cats and dogs in carbolic acid in order to get rid of the virus. By the end of October, more than 22,000 dogs and 270,000 cats were put to uh, sleep by the ASPCA. So again, here's another example of how animals did have a role in history. Well, tonight we're gonna to focus on some fun stories. And the first one we're gonna start off with is, is a cat story and a dog story, actually. The, the first part of the story is about a kitten who served as a good luck charm when a phenomenal event took place during the construction of the Battery Jeralman Street Tunnel under the East River. And then I'll also tell you about a dog who uh, was a guest on the very first train through that tunnel. So in May 1900, uh, we had a, commi a committee of about 50 Brooklyn men who appeared before New York's Rapid Transit Commission, and they wanted to advocate for a full extension of the subway to Brooklyn. The committee suggested a route that would extend down Broadway to the Battery in Manhattan, and then go under the East River and Jeralman Street in Brooklyn and past Borough Hall, all the way up to the Long Island Railroad Station. And here I'm showing you some of the, the illustrations that were made of this tunnel. So the contract to build this tunnel was signed in September 11, 1902, and ground was broken in 1903. So the work on the first tunnels between Manhattan and Brooklyn took place between 1903 and 1907. They, saw, uh, they started simultaneously from shafts at South Ferry in Manhattan and Henry Street in Brooklyn Heights. They originally wanted to build these two tunnels out in the open, and then they were gonna float them in place. However, the War Department at the time, they required that the water level atop the tunnels 
had to be at least 45 feet at low tide. There was also a lot of traffic on the East River. So the idea of floating these tunnels, that didn't work. Instead, they had to use a method called shield and compressed air tunneling, where the miners worked in a protective shield or a tent, like a support structure, and an inrush of water was prevented by using compressed air. And here's a, you know, an illustration of that. So by March 1905, the excavation on the Brooklyn side of the tunnel had reached just beyond Piers 17 and 18, which were then owned by the New York Dock Company. And it's a good thing that they got that far. Uh, there was a fellow by the name of Richard Ambrose Creedon. He was 25 years old. He worked in the tunnel. And on March 27, 1905, Creedon, along with uh, three other workers, were in this apron which was like a platform for the workers uh, to, as they were working in, in this mechanical shield. Well, Creedon noticed a small fissure at the top of the tunnel. He immediately shouted out a warning to his fellow workers, get out of here, it's the, the tunnel, it's gonna collapse. Then he climbed up a ladder and he got a bunch of sandbags in his hands and he just, it's kind of like Tom Thumb, he just took his, the sandbags and pushed them up against the, uh, the hole. And here's an illustration of what happened to this poor man. As the pressure in the tunnel increased, Creedon was pinned to the roof. And within seconds, the earth gave away, created like a little four foot wide hole. Creedon was pushed through the hole. He went through the hole, he went through the riverbed. And there he had a struggle with some shoring labels and he was choking on mud and stones. And uh, the water was kind of keeping him blocked. He was kind of like a cork at one point. It became a cork stuck in this hole. And all of a sudden it just blew and he blew up 20 feet through the air. They described it like a pea being shot through a putty blower. And he did a bunch of ar ar um, acrobatics in the air. You can see on this picture, he just missed. If he had come a little bit closer, he would have hit his head right on that dock. <clears throat> Although he was wearing overalls and boots, Turns out he was a pretty good swimmer. He was able to be rescued. Um, a couple of fishermen came out and rescued him. And once he got on the land, he joked with the newspapers. He said he had just that day asked his boss for a raise, but he, he never expected it to come so quick. So here's the animal part of the story. According to the Brooklyn Daily Standard Union, it was while Creedon was smoking his pipe and talking to the reporters, the little kitten made his appearance at the, at the tunnel. The little black kitten is about three months old. It peered down into the shaft and it decided to go exploring, started skinning down the shaft. Well, the workmen tried to shoo her away. And as one man said, but law sakes, that coon kitten just cocks his tail and keeps it going down. So they couldn't stop that kitten. He was determined to go into the tunnel. <clears throat> he jumped up into the, uh, into the cage that they used to lower the men in and out. And he went down there and uh, he became a mascot of the tunnels. And the tunnel workers agreed to keep him because they truly believed that he was a good luck charm. They felt that this kitten was a sign <clears throat> that this kitten was responsible for saving the lives of Creedon and those other men who had that horrible experience that day in the blowout. So nobody knows where the kitten came from, but he was very well groomed. They figured he was probably at the time having a, a good life in Brooklyn Heights. They named him Bright Eyes. And he adopted very well to the tunnel. He lived there for eight months at least that, that I can find out through newspaper articles. And uh, <clears throat> at one point he did have to share the tunnel with a dog named Subway Nelly. So no, it was November 27, 1907. And that was when the very first train went from Manhattan to Brooklyn. It was a test train, it had about 200 men on it including the IRT officials and engineers, reporters, and also a dog named Subway Nelly. And here's Subway Nelly. Here's a couple of old newspaper photos of Subway Nelly. So Nelly arrived at the tunnel um, in 1905 and she sought shelter in this man's office here, John McDonald. He had an office near uh, Brooklyn Borough Hall and he was the, the dog was frozen and starving and so John McDonald gave him some milk and then they allowed the dog to lay under the stove to get warm. And they didn't have the heart to keep the, uh, to kick the dog back outside in the middle of winter. And so they decided to, to keep the dog and they named her Nellie. Well, after a while, 
people began calling this excavation project, which was which was what it was originally, they began to call it the subway. And so at that point, they said, we got to name this dog Subway Nellie. And Subway Nellie became one of the workers. She would go down every day with the workmen in the tunnels. And she knew every nook and cranny. She knew all of the tools. She knew that if a workman had forgotten his hammer, she would go fetch it. She knew what he needed. <clears throat> she also figured out how to blow a cord with her teeth to blow the whistle every day that signaled the beginning and the end of the shifts. So a reporter from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle asked if they thought Nellie could tell time. One of the foremen said, maybe she can, but there are no clocks in the tunnel. So somehow or another, she just knew exactly when to, to pull the, that cord. So the first train um, was a standard eight car express train. It went from West Farm Square on June 9th, 1908 and arrived in Borough Hall with about uh, 800 passengers. I don't know, after this time, I don't know what happened to Nellie. I don't know what happened to Bright Eyes. I do know that the workmen told the newspapers that they would make sure that uh, Nellie lived her life in luxury for the rest of her life after the subway was completed. So I'm hoping that Bright Eyes, you know, either had good luck with the men or was able to return to a good home. So the next story is going to, we're going to jump to horses now. And this is going to be about the very last horses who pulled the horse-powered engines for the uh, Fire Department of New York, the FDNY. So up until 1865, fire engines and hose carts were actually pulled through the streets of New York by the, by the men themselves. Horsepower replaced manpower with the organization of the paid fire department in 1869. And for almost 50 years, horses did all the hauling and all the heavy work. Well, in 1910, under the watch of uh, Commissioner Rhinelander Waldo and Chief Edward Croker, the fire department tested its first motor-driven apparatus. And this was in Manhattan on East 12th Street. This high pressure hose wagon carried 40 lengths of hose and it could go an astounding 30 miles an hour on good roads or 25 miles an hour in the snow. The horse teams, they couldn't even compete with this. The horse teams could go 15 to 18 miles an hour max. And with every mile that the horses had to travel, that speed decreased. So they were just no match for the motorized engines. The city also introduced a, a water tower, a very large water tower that could not only go much faster than the horse driven water tower, but it, it also could back into narrow streets or alleys and get into places where the horses couldn't get. And so when this all happened, the New York Times wrote, this is what they wrote, they said, once more, the picturesque is to yield to the utilitarian. That thrilling sight, three plunging horses drawing engine or hook or ladder, one of the few thrilling sights to be seen in our streets is soon to become a thing of the past. On March 16, 1911, which was actually nine days before the, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, the city tested its very first motorized engine. It was bright red, it had bright red rubber wheels. It could pump 700 gallons of water a minute. And again, it could go about 30 to 40 miles an hour through the streets, which was amazing. That year, 1911, there were still about 1,550 fire horses in service with the FDNY. But the day after that this new engine was tested, the New York Times declared that the motorized apparatus was the death knell of the fire department horse. However, it wouldn't be until 1922, so 11 years later, that the last horse-drawn engine responded to a call, and that would take place in Brooklyn. So just a, a really quick little, because we're talking history here, little quick history of the Brooklyn department. The, the earliest recorded history of the Brooklyn Department goes back to April 7, 1772. And a meeting took place to choose six firemen in accordance to an act for the more effectual extinguishment of fires near the ferry in the township of Brooklyn in Kings County. In 1785, there was another meeting of freelander, freeholders and residents. And that took place at the house an inn of a widow by the name of Margaret Moser. And she lived on the old ferry road 
which uh, is today's old Fulton Street. And the men formed a volunteer fire department consisting of seven freeholders and they bought an engine from New York City. And this was actually the first engine ever to be made in the United States. Up until this point, England had been supplying America with all of America's uh, fire engines. So Brooklyn had the first New York State made fire engine. And as I note in here, everybody had to have uh, buckets. Every single resident had to have buckets so that they could use the buckets to fill up this contraption here. The first company uh, established, Brooklyn was the Washington Company number one, which was on Front Street. And this is a, an old photo of them from 1880. And as you can see, they have a dog. So there we go, another animal in history. And Engine Company 205, which is what we're gonna talk about tonight with, with the horses. Engine 205 was the last fire company to become motorized. And part of the delay, why it took 11 years, was because of World War I. But another was nostalgia. Engine 205 was Brooklyn's most famous and most influential fire company. It was organized in 1846 by a lot of young, upstanding, upstanding men from uh, wealthy families in downtown Brooklyn. Back then, it was a volunteer company. It was called Pacific Hose Number 14, AKA the Dude Company of the Heights. It was originally stationed on Love Lane near Henry Street, and then it moved to 160 Pierpont Street. The engine became engine uh, company number five when the Brooklyn Fire Department formed in 1869. And then it was named engine 105. And then in 1913, it became 205. So on the morning of December 20th, 19. 22, Fire Commissioner Do Thomas Drennan, Brooklyn Borough President Edward Regalman, firefighters Jiggs the Fire Dog, who I'll show, be talking about in a minute here, and other city dignitaries gathered around Borough Hall to pay their final tribute to the fire horse. At 10.15 a.m., Assistant Fire Chief Joseph P. Martin, a.k.a. Smokey Joe, tapped out the final call of the fire alarm box at Duralman and Court Street. And as I note here, Smokey Bear was named for this man right here, uh, Smokey Joe Martin. When the alarm sounded, Al Griffin took his place in the middle spot. So here's Al Griffin. Danny Bag and Penrose took either side of the hitch. George Murray was the driver that day. And Waterboy and Bucknell, the other two horses, they hooked up to a hose wagon. The horses dashed down Court Street to Duralman Jer and to the rear of Borough Hall. And as you can see there, the horses, I mean, they obviously they thought they were responding to a real call. And so did Jiggs, the, uh, the coach dog. Jiggs also thought they were going to a real call. So the muster ceremony ended, uh, Regalman placed wreaths on each horse. And the press took photos. This is the only photo I could take. I wish I could find a better quality, but you have the two uh, water boy and Bucknell here, and then the other three horses in this photo. And these are the motorized apparatus that replaced these five dogs. Reportedly, the dogs were retired. They either went to light duty on Bucknell, uh, Black, Blackwell's Island, or they went up to some upstate farms. Incidentally, my hometown of Warwick had a farm for retired New York City fire horses and other uh, working horses. So maybe one of these dogs ended up in my hometown. I'd like to think so. And there's Jiggs. So poor Jiggs, Jiggs had no idea. He didn't understand why, why weren't the men hooking up the hoses? Why weren't they fighting a fire? What was going on? He was, he was very upset. Um, <laughs> Jiggs was born in 1917. And he was presented to Engine Company 205 on Memorial Day that year. And right away, he bonded with a, with a fellow by the name of Thomas McEwen. And Jiggs was also friendly with the company's cat mascot. They had a mascot named Bum. And Jiggs loved Bum. And he also loved Bum's many kittens. The trouble began when he started up a friendship with a, a fellow by the name of John Martin, who had a restaurant, uh, this restaurant here. He started eating a lot of food 
And then all of the other restaurants started feeding him. He didn't get any exercise anymore because the horses were no longer, he wasn't running with the, with the motorized apparatus. And so by 1923, he weighed uh, 118 pounds. They, they sent him to a, uh, a place, a farm for canine reduction treatments. Um, just didn't really work. By 1925, the, the news reporters report, uh, said that he was fatter and lazier than ever. Um, and he just wasn't able to, to keep up with uh, his weight. Incidentally, um, fire the engine company 205 that I just talked about. I just want to mention this, that uh, engine company 205 and ladder 18 lost eight men in the attacks on 9-11. So now we're getting into a, a cat story. So in the, in the early 1890s, the Brooklyn Navy Yard was overrun with rodents. They were it was out of control. They were eating the, the ropes. They were eating all of the, the, the uh, sails. Basically, they were eating everything. And there weren't a lot of cats at that time. A lot of the cats were already on ships and things like that. Um, and so official tried all different things. They brought in uh, traps. They tried to poison the rats. Didn't work. They brought in dogs. <clears throat> they tried to use dogs. <laughs> I'm sorry, but in this uh, instance, the dogs just couldn't keep up with what the cats could do. The dogs were actually afraid of the rats and they ran away. Eventually there were some cats that discovered, hey, there's a lot of rats here, let's, let's live here. And so by 1900, there were quite a few rats, uh, cats and rats, excuse me. <clears throat> so this fella here, Francis Bowles, he was the rear admiral, chief constructor of the Navy. And when he came, at the Brooklyn uh, Navy Yard, he told all the men <clears throat> they were not to harm the cats because the cats did not cost the government any money. All they had to do was get some scraps of food once in a while from the men, <clears throat> catch the rats, and in return, they saved the United States government thousands of years, thousands of dollars a year by keeping away all of the rats and protecting all of the the sales and the, the provisions and things like that. And again, just, just a real quick, um, just some photos here I have of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, you know, the, the Brooklyn, it started out as the New York Naval Shipyard and it's located in the Wallabat Bay. And this area was first settled uh, in the 1600s. Um, there was a fellow by the name of Jarus Repelje he was a tavern owner and he purchased about 335 acres of land and he started a little mining and farming village. And excuse me if I, there are some old Dutch names here and I'm probably gonna butcher them. I, I wanna apologize ahead of time. Following the Battle of Long Island in 1776, um, the Continental Army soldiers were taken prisoner in a lot of the ships that were kept in, in the Wallabout, Wallabout Bay. And about 11,500 soldiers actually died on these prison ships. And later on, as they were building the Navy Yard, actually they, they found some of, the, some of the bones from these men, they actually found them as they were building the, the Navy Yard. So after the revolution, um, we had some brothers, the Jackson brothers, they were able to uh, purchase the land, John, Samuel, and Treadwell. They uh, purchased the land and they built a, a shipyard and they had their little farm. And I love this picture because again, here we are talking about history and we have some cows in the picture here. The, John, uh, the, the brothers sold their property to the United States government for $40,000. And then in 1806, it became the United States Navy shipyard. So getting back to the cats, unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of the cats, <clears throat> but I do have some information about them. There were a couple of cats named Tom and Minnie. These were two black cats and they worked in the electrical building. And Minnie was actually the best uh, rat catcher in the yard. One of the workmen said she deserved a, a gold medal for preserving the property of the United States government. There was another cat named Jerry who was the oldest cat in the yard. And Jerry was partners with a cat named George Dewey. And these two cats were responsible for uh, 
keeping the mice in check in the rigging loft. And the worker there who they worked with was a guy named uh, Bill Cohen. And he told the, the newspapers that once the two cats were on the job, he no longer had to worry about the rats running up his legs or trying to you know, eat all of his materials. He was a sail maker. There was another cat named Joan of Arc and she used to have a lot of kittens. And one of the workers said that <laughs> Joan of Arc was a Republican feline who came from Omaha, but she could smell a rat just as quick as a Democrat. That was a quote in the, the newspapers. So during the war years, um, most of the cats, they headed out onto the ships to become ship mascots. But when the war ended, the cat colony started getting, um, it started getting overpopulated again. And there was a fellow by the name of Bill Wade and he decided, well, he was gonna save all these cats. The Navy was trying to trap them. They wanted to trap them and get rid of them. Bill Wade ran around um, opening up the, the traps. And he must've done a pretty good job because by the time he retired in 1965, there were about 1500 cats on the property. And even to this day, there's still a, a feral colony and there are some women that are trying to take care of them and, and get them neutered and, and so forth. So some of those cats may very well be uh, related to these old Brooklyn Navy cats. One of, the, one of the Brooklyn Navy cats, the most famous was a cat named Tom. He was born at the Brooklyn Navy Yard in 1885. He was very well respected. Um, all of the, the sailors, they, they loved him. They thought he just brought their ships good luck. And he served for many years with the USS Maine uh, this ship here, which was built in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And he served under the command of a man named Captain Sigsby and Commander Wainwright. And like all ship cats, it was his job to get rid of all the rats and the mice on the ship. He was considered at one time to be the oldest active cat in the Navy. In January, 1898, um, some of you may be familiar with this story, the, the Maine went from Key West to Havana during the Cuban War of Independence. And at about 9.40 p.m. on February 15th, a massive explosion ripped through the, the ship. At the time of the explosion, Tom was sleeping three decks below the upper deck. And the force of the explosion was so great that he was literally fired through, it's kind of like Creedon from the, the first story, he was fired through three steel decks and he flew out of the air. The sailors, they had no idea that he had survived. And it wasn't until the next morning <clears throat> that this fellow here, uh, Commander Wainwright, heard some meowing and he took a boat out and he went out and, and Tom was clinging to the wreck and they took him, uh, they brought him to the USS Fern and he was, uh, they took pictures of him and he continued his active service with the Navy for a few more years. Unfortunately, there were 260 men and two other cats on that boat that did not survive that explosion. <clears throat> so now I'm gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna talk about dogs. Um, we're gonna talk about police dogs and you may not know, but the first uh, real, the first genuine canine police force in the United States was in Parkville, Brooklyn. So the police dog actually started in Germany around 1896. Uh, Ghent in Belgium was the, the place to go for police dogs. And by 1901, police dogs were used all over the world, except for America. So it took America a little bit longer to get, to get the police dog. First police dogs to come to Parkville was in 1907. And I'm just gonna quick, just to show you where were the story is taking place. We're, take, we're gonna be in this little village here called Parkville. Um, and Parkville's history kind of begins with the Coney Island Plank Road, which is now Coney Island Avenue, which opened in 1850. It was a wooden plank road to get better access for people to get to Coney Island. And uh, Parkville developed along this scenic route. It was kind of a rural haven and a pit stop for people who were going from downtown Brooklyn to Coney Island. And then here's just another little map of the village. So the United Freemen's Association in 1851, they purchased um, farms that were owned by John Ditmas and John Treadwell. And it was about 114 acres. They purchased it for $57,000. And then they laid out a grid system 
Um, and, and you can see the grid system kind of has its own little, it goes, you know, uh, more straight up and down compared to the existing the existing streets that were there. And they built a lot of just nice little frame houses. And it was a very attractive suburb, uh, became uh, Parkville in 1871. And it was actually part of uh, Flatbush. And again, another map just showing the, the village of Parkville. So as I said, in 1907, um, they, the police department sent over uh, a man by in Inspector George Wakefield. He went over to, to Ghent to look into getting some dogs. And he was very impressed with them. Um, these dogs were trained to trust only men in uniform and they were, to ditch, they were not to trust any man laying down or crouching. So he brought back five dogs, each were about a year old and they were called Jim, Nogi, Lady, Donna and Max. So there's your first genuine canine squad in New York City and all of America. Total cost, including the dogs, $364.84. So upon arrival in New York, they went up, the department had some kennels uh, near Fort Washington Park by Riverside Drive, um, right about where 100, uh, West 177th Street is today. This is a, a picture of that property. And they spent a few months there getting special training. So the dogs were trained to obey fundamental com commands. They were trained to recognize, again, like I said, men in uniform were their friends and all others were possible enemies. They were trained to answer at once to the police whistle and also to hurl themselves upon someone attacking a police officer and also to pursue any fleeing criminal. They also learned how to search around buildings at night and to signal bark in the presence of people lurking in the shadows. So following their, their training, uh, the five canines were declared fit for service, 1908, and they went off to Parkville, Brooklyn. The village at the time was experiencing a lot of nighttime burglaries, and so they thought that this would be a good place to put the dogs. Um, each patrolman was assigned with one dog, and uh, the, the five officers that were chosen were chosen because not only did they love dogs, but they also enjoyed doing police work. And the, the, the canine and human partner would team up every night from 11 till six. And uh, they would let the dogs run loose. Um, the dogs often would run 25 or 30 miles during each of their seven hour shifts. And here's just an, an old picture of some of the little quaint little houses in Parkville. So one of the stories of the dog Max actually, one night he led officers to a vacant lot on 37th Street and 15th Avenue, which was actually about a mile away. And that took the officers a while to catch up with him. But when they got there, he led them behind a snowbank, and there was a man half frozen and, and unconscious. And so the, the policemen were able to save this man. His name was Ed Connolly. They put him in the patrol wagon and uh, he was charged with intoxication, but he did live. So the question here though is, was Mark, was Max the dog, was he smart enough to lead the officers to Ed Connolly because he knew that the man was in trou trouble or did he think that the man was someone bad because he was not in uniform and he was laying down? We'll never know, something to think about. I'm going to jump to a, another cat story. And this is about a cat who liked to go fishing. And she actually would jump in the water and fish. And this uh, story takes place on what used to be the family fishery of the Cortell family, Cortell U family, Peter Cortell U. Um, and this was on the uh, located on the Narrows. It was at the foot of present Battery Avenue, right next to the Diker Meadows. And so here's some old maps and I've circled where the, the uh, Cortellu fishery was and then also where the, uh, the story that I'm gonna be telling about the fishing cat takes place. So Diker Meadows, um, here's some pictures here. Diker Meadows was really just an, an area of marsh and swamps and meadows. It was kind of a wasteland um, in 1652. And again, I'm gonna apologize because I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, but it's Cornelis van Verkoven of Uric Holland. 
he came over uh, with the Dutch West India Company and he wanted to establish a colony right along this area. And here he was gonna establish two colonies. This area was called the Nyack Tract and he purchased it from some of the natives there some clothing and tools. He was able to purchase the land. He bought us himself a, a log house, <clears throat> kind of where Fort Hamilton is today. And he also built a mill on his property. And much of his property included what we know today as the Fort Hamilton area and the Diker Beach uh, golf course. <clears throat> Here's one of the uh, Cortellius houses. Verhoeken died in 1655. He had gone back to the Netherlands, he died. He had no children in America. And so the only person that he could have the land go to was his tutor, his children's tutor uh, by the name of Jack Cortelio. And Jack Cortelio became the de facto owner of the land grant. And uh, Jack divided the land into 21 lots, 50 acres each. And the lots were granted to 19 men and two of the lots were reserved for poor people. They, uh, the new property owners, they were able to use dikes just like they did in, in Amsterdam in order to uh, drain the marshy land, <clears throat> hence Diker Meadows. Um, didn't go too far, only about 12 houses were built, so it didn't really get that big. <clears throat> Here's another one of the Cortelio houses, Isaac Cortelio house. Um, it's, it went through several owners. I love that it was last owned uh, by a fellow named the name of Edward E. Golf, which is kind of appropriate now that there's a golf course there. Um, so Ver, uh, Verko uh, Verkoven's house burned down in 1672 and it was replaced with a stone house. The US government actually demolished that stone house and they used the stones to build Peter's house here. And, and sadly, as I noted, the, the house was, just, was demolished too. They, for $1,000, if somebody had paid it, they would have been able to have saved this. So it's, it's really a, a great loss. I'm not gonna get into the, into the history. We don't really have time, but this whole area where we are right now, where we're talking about just played a huge role in the revolution. I'm just gonna skip to 1836, a fellow by the name of William Post purchased the Cortelyu property. And when he died, it went off to his children, including his daughter, uh, Matilda, who was married to a guy named Isaac Delaplane. And here you can see Delaplane. This was the Cortelyu property. Now it's owned by, by Delaplane. And this all in here was the Diker Meadows property. And at that time, it was just kind of used for sheep and cattle grazing. And here's another, another photo. And again, I, picked, I put this photo in here because there are animals in here. So yes, it was used for the, uh, the local people to come and, and graze their, their sheep or their cows. So a fellow by the name of Archibald Young, he, he, was, uh, he developed Bath Beach. He came along with a, an actor named Barney Williams and they purchased all of these lands in the 1870s. Um, Archibald didn't want people to have their animals on his land, so he put up a fence and he had a private watchman to keep all the cows and sheep and everything out. Uh, local residents were not too thrilled about this. They were very angry. Some of them even threatened Archibald with bodily harm. So eventually he had to give in and it became uh, pasture grounds again. But by then, big things were coming. The city was looking to build a, a public park. They were looking at the site for their park. <clears throat> but in 1895, um, a group of men uh, led by this fellow here, Timothy Woodruff, they proposed taking having 44 acres and building a golf club and a golf course. And here we go. So here's the cat. So Lily, Ru Lillian Russell was this golf course. It, she was their mascot. And the, the, the Diker Meadow Golf Club was around 7th Avenue between 92nd Street and, and the waterfront. Lillian was actually named for the famous American actress and singer Lillian Russell. She came to the golf course in 1900. She was very intelligent. All of the members loved her. They wrote a song about her. Every uh, annual dinner that they had, they would uh, give her praise. Lillian was very good at fishing. She loved to dive. There were several ponds on the property and she liked to go in and catch fish. <clears throat> Sometimes she would also steal fish. If the caddies 
were on the grounds and they were fishing, she would go up and follow them and steal fish from their pails. But uh, she, she did it pretty good on herself. And, and the men would oftentimes also allow her to uh, have some of their graham crackers or maybe some pumpkin pie from the clubhouse. So she, she lived pretty good. And if, if there weren't a lot of fish that day, she could get some mice or the men would give her uh, you know, some food from the clubhouse. <clears throat> Lillian had a lot of kittens. She had quite a few. And every time she had kittens, it was reported in the newspaper. By 1904, she had 42, she had given birth to 42 kittens. And in 1906, she was up to 66. <clears throat> By 1908, it was 88 kittens. Fortunately, um, there was a high demand for her kittens among the golf club members and most of the cats and the kittens were adopted. Oops. On July 30th, 1908, there was a large story about Lillian Russell in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. And it provided an explanation as to why the flag at the clubhouse had been at half mast. Some of the residents thought it was at half mast because uh, uh, President Grover Cleveland had died in June of that year. Nobody really knew, but it turns out that it was in memory of Lillian Russell. Um, apparently Lillian had gone fishing um, by one of her favorite ponds. And, you know, it, she, she just passed away. I mean, just, you know, probably either from having too many kittens or just from old age. Um, the members examined her. They couldn't find any wounds from any firearms or dog bites or anything like that. So they thought it was just, you know, natural, natural causes. They, uh, the men had up a, a little casket built for her and they had a little memorial service and she was buried under one of the trees by the caddy house. Um, and they marked the, the grave with some kind of stone. I don't know, I would love to, to see if that's, if anybody could find that. Um, she did have some of her uh, ch children, Lillian Russell too, and another kitten named Mr. Diker. They became uh, the next honorary members of the golf club. So incidentally, the nearby Marine and Field Club, which was right nearby, they also had a mascot. They had a dog named Bob, and Bob didn't live at the golf course. He was actually owned by a, a woman golfer named Miss Maud Pottle. And Miss Pottle, she actually had a patent on a special harness that she had attached to her dog. And so Bob would carry her golf clubs around the course. I just find that to be very amusing. And then here's just some old pictures of it when it was being uh, constructed, the golf course. This is an aerial view from 1924 and a picture of the old, uh, actually the, the new golf, the new golf clubhouse. And that's uh, still there today. It's now an 18 hole course. And then just an aerial shot of the, the, the golf course here. And it was in this little section here where the Poly Prep Country Day School is, that's where the original golf course was. And those ponds where Lillian went fishing, those ponds are still on the property. Now we're gonna to get to a, a turtle that, that liked to drink, I guess, I know. Um, so this, this story of, of Floyd, it, it's kind of, a, kind of a famous legend. Um, it, this all started when a customer brought three pet turtles into the Toddy Inn on Fifth Avenue in Bay Ridge in 1933. And soon after uh, the customer placed all three of the turtles on the bar, um, he wanted to show off their racing skills. And there he is. So there's Floyd. So they were doing this racing. One of the turtles decided to make an escape and <laughs> Every year from that point on, the turtle whom they named Floyd would show up at the bar every year on his own. And he did that for about 20 years, he would show up at this bar. And here's the inn here. So according to the bartender, um, he'd walk through the back door, he would take residence under the same booth in the tavern. And for about a week, he would just take a nap and he would take short walks around the bar. None of the patrons ever fed him although once in a while, somebody would give him a little, like one of the managers would give him some lettuce or something like that. Um, and the, the problem, the, the area that Floyd lived actually is very similar neighborhood to what we were talking about before. 
Um, again, here's our friend Cor Cornelius von Verhoeven who wanted to set up a colony. So we're, we're basically in the, the same uh, area that this uh, man acquired again in 1652. And I just have an arrow here. Again, here's kind of where the, the Toddy Inn is. Uh, it was a, a farm at one point uh, by the name of Hoyt Campbell owned the farm. He was a horse breeder. And it is here that the Toddy Inn was constructed. And here's another picture at uh, one point uh, I guess about after 20 years of being a bachelor, Floyd showed up with, a, with another turtle <clears throat> and everybody assumed that this was his girlfriend. Uh, as one of the, as the owner actually told the press, he said, Floyd decided it was a good place to bring a gal of good family for a drink or two. And uh, having the turtles around really drummed up business. People really enjoyed having them. Um, it was surmised that the turtles probably um, lived, they might have lived in the backyard of the inn and then they would hibernate in the ground. And then every spring they would come up out of the ground and come to the, the tavern. And I have to wonder again, there was a, a big nursery and greenhouse at the time. Here is where the Toddy Inn was. I just making this up, but maybe, maybe the two turtles enjoyed spending the, uh, the winter months in the, uh, the greenhouse. My last story is another cat story. It's one of my very favorite stories. It is about a cat uh, who lived to be 28 years. He was <clears throat> described as an enormous tiger cat of striking appearance. And for 28 years, he was Brooklyn's official cat. He was actually the mascot of a, a, fella, a fellow by the name of Terry Fox. So Terry Fox had a cafe near Brooklyn City Hall and uh, Jerry lived with, with Terry Fox. But during the day, um, he would patrol the neighborhood. And here's, this is not him. I couldn't find a picture, but here's a cat. Jerry did wear glasses. I will tell you about that. And this is, you know, the old Borough Hall neighborhood. And, and incidentally, all of these buildings were built uh, during uh, Jerry's reign. Like I said, he lived for 28 years. He arrived uh, sometime around 1878 is when he uh, was born. And over the years, Jerry really had a fascinating life. He made friends with all the guys building the Brooklyn Bridge. He played dominoes with uh, boss Hugh McLaughlin in City Hall. He would hang out with all the, the homeless men in, in Murphy Park. He really had a lot of friends. He was very, very well loved. So this is, again, I'm just showing this again for some history. This is Jerry's neighborhood. Um, so his beat really included Brooklyn City Hall, the municipal building, um, the Polytechnic Institution Courthouse, and the Reformed Dutch Church. And Jerry would go around and, and he was kind of like a police cat. If he saw something wrong, if it seemed like there was something amiss, he would start howling. And uh, a couple of times he actually stopped a, a burglary from happening at the cafe where he lived by just meowing very loudly. But this was his, I like to call it, this was his beat. And one of the stories, just real quick, I just, because I find this so fascinating, is this area here uh, where the church was, um, it was, in the 1880s, they wanted to move the, the old Dutch reformed church, they, they wanted to move it and use it as a lecture hall. That didn't go through. It was actually sold in 1886 to this guy named Charles Willoughby for $250,000. And Willoughby had this beautiful church taken down. And he put up this thing called a cyclorama and here's a picture of it. And this whole cyclorama thing was this craze during that time. And it, it kind of looked like this. This isn't the one in Brooklyn, but it was this large uh, round building. And inside was this uh, kind of a, a panoramic painting. And this is actually a picture of what was in the Brooklyn cyclorama. And I just kind of find that interesting um, that this was on that site for a couple of years. Eventually um, it was taken down a, a fellow by the name of George Murphy, uh, he worked for the Department of Public Works. He decided let's have a park made on this site. And it was uh, 650 bucks he was able to put in this beautiful park called Murphy Park. Uh, it was beautiful for a while, but then eventually it became uh, filled with homeless, uh, homeless people. And it was also uh, very popular with teenage gangs. And so here's, a, here's an old picture of the Murphy's 
Park. And Jerry Fox, in his older years, he started spending a lot of time in this park. He liked to sit and hang out with, with the homeless men and, and the, the gangs, and they all loved him. Well, sometime around 1903, uh, Jerry lost his eyesight, but he had a friend who had a Dr. Charles Hughes, who had a, uh, an office here, his eye doctors, and he made glasses for Jerry. The, the New York Times said the glasses gave Jerry a certain quaint dignity. And everyone loved putting the glasses on Jerry and they would pose him for pictures, but everyone also knew that he was blind and they would uh, do whatever they could to make sure he was protected. Unfortunately, uh, and here's some, another picture. He actually, one time though, he did save Brooklyn Hall from burning down. He was walking through Brooklyn Hall. He smelled smoke and he started crying and it turned out there was a cigar on a desk. And I like to say that by crying and alerting the police officers who put the fire out, I like to say that Jerry Fox prevented this fire from happening at Borough Hall in, in uh, 1904. And that's it. Uh, by the time 1904, um, you know, he was pretty decrepit. He was, he, like I said, he was 28 years old and uh, he died in 1904. They, they found Jerry. Um, he actually fell down a subway shaft. And I'm just, I'm going to close with this quote from the, uh, the New York Times. And this is what they said when they uh, discovered that Jerry had passed away. They wrote, had each of the several hundred city office holders, judges, lawyers, volunteer firemen, war veterans, and businessmen in Borough Hall Square lost an old college chum. There could not have been sorrow more profound than that which greeted the death of Jerry. And that's it, everyone. Just wondering if there's any questions. I can't hear anything. Hello, Peggy. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yes, I can. Great. Just to make sure there's no confusion about uh, where the questions are coming through. I have them on my end, so I can read you a couple if that's all right. Okay, great. Does that work for you? Yeah, that's great. All right. So, uh, First off, great presentation. Thank you for all that information. Uh, we do have a couple of questions coming in from our audience. Uh, the first one that I've got is, uh, what were the Parkville dogs trained to do to criminals that they found? They were trained to, to knock them down, basically. Um, they were trained to, to chase after them once they got the signal. And then they were just trained to, they would literally like, uh, you know, I'm sure we've all had a, a large dog jump on us or whatever, and they were just trained to knock them to the ground. There was no other, um, nothing else harsh. They weren't going to bite them or hold them down or anything. It was just to, to keep them, stop them from running and uh, in order to allow the, the police officers to, you know, get the handcuffs on or, or whatever they were going to, you know, maybe they weren't going to arrest the person. Maybe they just wanted to talk to them. But yeah, there was no, um, there was no biting or anything like that. And another question we have from our audience is um, that someone is curious about any information you have on Pigtown also known as Pig Hollow, which they say was a neighborhood in Flatbush that was overrun with pigs in the late 1800s. You know, it's in my files, actually. Um, I don't, I have not yet done a story on that, but um, I do have, I have a, I, I must have two or 300 potential stories that I keep on file. And that one is definitely one of the ones that are in, in my file. I did talk about the, the pigs over where, um, the old uh, stadium, you know, the for the Brooklyn Dodgers. That one I do talk about a little bit in my book, um, in, on, and, but that's the only story I've done so far with pigs. But I'll get to one of these days. <laughs> uh, so, so another person in our audience wants to know uh, how you do your research, and uh, that kind of dovetails with, uh, you know, somebody else asked. How did you get interested in animals and start looking at their fascinating stories? Right. Well, I, I started getting into it. Um, I had 
purchased a book from my, my father years ago on the history of the Palisades Amusement Park. And I wanted to, I was giving it to him, but I wanted to read it first. So I read it. And while I was reading it, there was a, just one paragraph about this cat who came over from New York, uh, from Paris to New York City in 1911. And this cat would sit on chicken eggs and hatch the eggs at Palisades Amusement Park. So she was like a sideshow attraction and people would come to spend money to watch this, ha this cat hatch eggs, hence the hatching cat. And I was going to actually write a, a children's book called The French Hatching Cat. And as I started kind of digging into the history and I actually found some old newspaper articles and things like that, I realized, well, this is kind of a really fun way to, to learn about history and also to share uh, stories and to share history with other people. So that's kind of how it started. I then for about a year or so, I just started going through old newspaper archives and just setting aside all kinds of bizarre animal stories. And, uh, and that's how I got into it. So most of my research is through old newspaper archives, whether it's the New York Times or the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, or, you know, any of the number of archives that are out there. Um, I also get tips from people. Um, I had a, an actor one time call, uh, contacted me uh, with a story about a, a cat who was uh, the mascot for the Lambs Club, the theatrical club. Um, so that was kind of a neat story. So people do, do contact me with ideas, uh, but it's mostly, I start off with newspapers and then I start digging through books and, and other resources to, to put it all together. That's great. Uh, we have a couple more uh, questions uh, from our audience here. Uh, one person would like to know if you have any idea as to why dogs are associated with fire trucks. And I suppose we can also lump this one in there. Does Sheep's Head Bay have anything to do with actual sheep? <laughs> the dog question, actually, I'm a volunteer firefighter. I've been a volunteer firefighter for 25 years. So a lot, I do a lot of fire stories because that's another one of my passions, but the dogs were actually used um, to keep the, the horses in line. They would, they would kind of run with the horses and so that was their whole point. But firehouses didn't just have dogs, firehouses also had cats and they were also allowed to have singing birds. Um, there was actually, there's actually a law on the books at one time that said that firehouses could have, I think it was something like one cat, one dog, but not both and an unlimited number of singing birds, which I just find is very bizarre. Um, but yeah, but most people think of the dog, but there were cats too. And the cats often ran on, the, went on the fire engines and responded to calls and climbed ladders and did all that stuff. And that's, I talk about that in my book. But yeah, the dogs were just to kind of keep the, the horses in line. And then the other question about, oh, Sheep's Head Bay. You know what? It's a good question. I really haven't, uh, I haven't done it. I have a story on my blog that takes place um, in that area and it's about goats. Um, a lot of people had goats there. So, but yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to look that up. But if you go on my site, um, you can do, you can do searches for different animals or different areas of the city. If you, if you're interested in finding out that I know I did do a goat story. Uh, so we have another question here. Um, a lot of these uh, stories that you've told us have to do with uh, animals who kind of become mascots right. and that, uh, that seemed to be a, a, a running gag for, for a period of time in history. Uh, when and why did this practice fall out of fashion? But I, I really want to call attention to the last part of this question. For everyone except bodegas, because of course the bodega cat is uh, <laughs> a tried and true symbol of New York. Oh, yes. I mean, and actually, no, there still are. Um, there still are many mascots. You have to understand back then, we didn't have such restrictive laws, right? So even every ship, and I'm not just talking Navy ships, I'm talking passenger ships, um, you know, like a, a carnival cruise ship type of ship, they were allowed to have cats and dogs on their ship and the passengers would interact. Uh, look at the Algonquin cats, right? The Algonquin cats up until I think 2012 had free reign of the hotel. They could come in and out. They could go into the different rooms. They could go in the kitchen, New York health department, boom, put that out of, you know, and we know that that happened with uh, some of the bar cats too. New York health department said, no, we cannot have uh, animals walking around in, in places where there are food and things like that. So that's really a main reason, but to this day, there are still um, 
mascot cats and dogs associated with with the fire departments and the police departments in places where there where there is not food and they're allowed to to have them but no more on passenger ships um, and even the navy doesn't even allow the mascots anymore uh, I just want to thank you for your wonderful presentation tonight. I have one more question that I'd like to ask from our audience, and that'll be uh, all of the time all we have time for tonight. So thank you to our uh, audience members for joining us and for their great questions. Sorry we can't get to all of them. Um, but to end, uh, in your research, what's what was the most unusual pet that you found that somebody had? Most unusual. Oh, most unusual pet. Well, there was actually a. Uh, and I don't know if I'd call it a pet, but one of the most unusual stories I found out was it actually is Manhattan um, down on old Roosevelt Street, which doesn't exist anymore. It's now a NYCHA, it's now a uh, New York housing, uh, you know, big housing development. But there was a, a man there on Roosevelt Street who collected all kinds of exotic animals. And he had a manatee and he had lions and he had tigers. Um, he, I think he may even had bear, he had monkeys. And sometimes the animals would get loose and they would be like up on the roof where he lived. Um, he had, for the manatee, he had like a big tank. So that, um, yeah, and that you can look on my website. I, I love that story. And that, that's just the most bizarre, <laughs> probably the most bizarre of all animals stories that I have. Never any shortage of fascinating things to uncover. Uh, <laughs> Thank you again for your presentation and thanks again to everyone who tuned in. Uh, to learn more, you can check out uh, The Cat Men of Gotham, which is Peggy's book, or of course, The Hatching Cat, which is her blog. We put links to both in uh, the chat. Um, and again, thank you, take Peggy, and thank you for everyone. And uh, everyone have a nice night and stay safe out there. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you for attending.